So we'll begin uh, a review of some initial concepts for module three. Um, module three is largely an extension of module two. In module two, we started looking at how we can combine basic logic gates. And if you extend that idea and take it out a little further, module three involves some, uh, some other building blocks. When you look at computers, there are primary components in a computer. You might call them chips or circuits or components, hardware components. We'll start, um, we'll start dipping our toe in a review of basic computer system components in module three. And, and once again, it's just more and more complex um, of what we've done in, in module two. So for our student learning objectives in module three, we want you to be able to explain how a common physical circuit can be built to create basic logic gates. One of the things that we want to impress upon you is the physical world. So there, there are layers of components and we've been talking to date about logical concepts and logical components. And logic gates are physical in nature, um, but on a more basic level, we wanna take it back into the historical aspect of electronics so that you understand, okay, how, how did computers come about in the first place? Oh, that was electronics. How did electronics come about? Well, that, that was uh, more about physics and physical sciences. And so we wanted to talk a bit about physical circuits and electricity and that kind of thing. Given a compound Boolean function, we want you to derive the equivalent compound logic gate and pseudocode. So if we give you the function, we want you to be able to draw the logic gate or a, an equivalent logic gate. And we want you to be able to come up with the logical statement. So when we say pseudocode, we're talking about, we're focusing on the logical statement. So we're taking a deeper dive in this module with regard to the, you know, we last module, it was canonical expressions. This, this module, we're talking more about the logic statements or what we would otherwise know, know as pseudocode. Okay, um, let me capture this very quickly. Okay. Given the implementation view of a composite logic gate, derive the Boolean function. So one of the one of the things we're going to do is facilitate your development of, of uh, expertise, right? Um, subject matter experts, they crawl, they walk and they run. We wanna be able to work forwards and backwards. If we give you a logic gate, can you give me the Boolean function? If we give you a Boolean function, can you draw an equivalent logic gate? And then of course we get back to the pseudocode, right? The logic statement. So we're gonna be practicing, facilitating, um, different scenarios so that you get more confident, you gain more confidence, and we're going to get a little more complex along the way. We'll provide an example of how the same Boolean function or logic gate can be made differently. So this is one of the beautiful things about electronic design and chip design is that you can intentionally screw things up on purpose to achieve a different a similar result, but a different result. And one of my favorite examples is our casino example. So we explain the significance of the arrangement using AND and OR logic gates in a casino example. Are all of you familiar with the one-armed, what we call a one-armed bandit? Sounds familiar, but I don't remember what it means. Has anyone ever heard the term before when we talk about casinos, the one-armed bandit? I've, I've heard it before, but I don't remember what it exactly means. Okay. Is it a slot machine? A slot machine, yes. It is a slot machine. So a slot machine has one arm, and you pull that arm, and then it rotates the display until 
you get an outcome, but you don't get to pull the arm unless you pay, right? So that one arm will rob you of your, <laughs> of your earnings if you're not careful. But casinos can use, all of this is electronic now, right? And there's an old saying, the house always wins. Hopefully after the example we share with you in this module, it will leave no doubt in your mind why it's a very bad idea to love gambling past a point because the house will always win. It is a certainty, a mathematical certainty. And there's a lot of design behind it. And yes, now that uh, slot machines are electronically based, it, it's uh, pretty easy to slant things in the favor of the casino. The only catch is, well, they wanna give you a taste of what it feels like to win, right? So they dial it back and dial up a winning probability that is much higher when you first, when they, they hey, we have a fresh, we have fresh clients on the floor, right? We have, we have fresh gamblers on the floor. Oh, we have some newbies, novice, right? Oh, I've never been in a casino before. One of the things they do is they look and they watch for people who they haven't had in their casino before. And if they're new guests, Oh, well, they want to give them a taste of how good it is to be in this casino. So they give them a taste of winnings and it's invigorating. Put another way, it uh, ramps up a neurochemical in your brain, right? That is, is uh, the basis of experiencing pleasure, right? So, so it's dopamine. They give you a rush. It's, it's the rush of winning and you get excited and then after people realize, hey, I'm on a streak, all they gotta do is turn a dial. And now that they've got you hooked, they're gonna reel you in. So it's a bit like fishing, right? Give them a, or it's a bit like, um, it's not unlike what uh, organized crime and drug dealers do. They, they're, they're pushers, right? They give people a taste, here, have a taste. And then once you're hooked, it's like, oh, I gotta go back, right? So you go back and that's when they bleed you dry. And I, I am gonna spend some quality time on this because this is one of those value added things we want you to, we want you to understand the relevance of the technology behind this, right? We want you to match the most basic logic gates with canonical expressions. So we want you to become almost reflexive. It's like, oh, this canonical, that's an and. Oh, that canonical, that's gotta be an or. So when you look at a certain canonical, you wanna know intuitively, it's like, oh, except for one case, this is always false. Hmm, that sounds like an and to me. Oh, except for one case, it's always true. Hmm, sounds like an or, right? You're gonna get more practice at drawing compound logic gates. You're gonna be doing more and more complex. This next solution, you'll have to take it up a whole level of complexity compared to what you did before. We want you to be able to represent IO mapping in HDL. So you're gonna have inputs and outputs. Outputs from one set of logic gates that are inputs to other logic gates. That's what we're talking about. Any questions so far? Uh, hey, Dr. Kentop, about the casino thing, um, when my mother went to Vegas, one of the locals who were there said, don't ever gamble in the strip because that's where all the newer machines are. If you want to gamble and make some kind of money, go to the old part of Las Vegas because that's where they have the machines that are still like old. Fremont Street. It's called Fremont Street. The old. Yeah. Street. Yeah. Yeah. That street. <laughs> Yeah, Fremont. It's off to the side and they have a they have a light show, a laser show at night. It's really cool. And they also have the best uh, all you can eat buffets in Vegas. So, yeah. Yeah, if you're if you've been around a bit, you, you don't I mean the don't get me wrong, the new casinos on the strip are very uh flashy and they're amazing. You know, they're designed for tourists. But if you want to be a serious gambler, yeah. That's a good point. Thank you for sharing that. The older machines, uh, well, they still have certain mechanisms to slant things in the favor of the house, but 
they're not nearly as effective and easy to use, right? So anyway, yeah, I'm sure you've seen in movies where, you know, there are magnets under the table and the roulette wheel is rigged and that kind of thing, right? So anyway, all right. We want you to be able to, we're going to talk a good bit about the mux and the demux, multiplexing. Multiplexing changed things. Multiplexers allow for selection. Put another way, switches. You may have heard the term switch in reference to networks, a network switch, an electronic switch. When you can, when you can implement selection of an input, you're switching. And that's a dynamic that changed the world. It's what made some of our most primary electronic components feasible, possible, right? But it really helps to start, all right, you're gonna do more. Yeah, we said we were gonna do more with the logic gauge. So I want you to understand intuitively what's going on here. And this is a point of confusion for most students. But this idea of parallel versus series, okay? The first thing you do is to understand what a closed circuit does. So if we have a, a battery here and we have wires, this is a basic elementary school science experiment. If the circuit is closed, what we mean is that the wire is connected all the way around throughout or the battery is, is in the loop and the light is in the loop. And so there's electric current that flows and then there's output of some type that's desired. And then uh, the cycle of life continues, right? In every circuit, there's also something called a ground. And this is phenomenally important. So a proper ground is essential for proper function of any and all electronics. I'm gonna say that again. You have to have a proper ground in order for circuits that involve electronics to function properly. You can have a closed circuit that doesn't have a ground. And this is an example. There's no ground, there's no electric that uh, returns to the ground as in like the physical ground, as in the dirt we walk on outside ground, right? The earth is the ultimate ground, planet earth. And so ultimately electrons are kind of like water. There's a water cycle. And at some point they have to return to the earth. But in microscopic or limited scales, you can have scenarios where you're just dealing with an enclosed set of components and there's no ground in the mix. So it's important to understand that you can have both closed circuits that are isolated from a ground and then you have in more sophisticated scenarios, you, you have to have a ground in order for things to work right. We'll explain more later. When the circuit is open, open, the O for open should mean off as in the light bulb is off, as in O, as in zero. This is one, this is zero. In fact, in Europe, you'll see light switches labeled with a one and a zero, and the one means, okay, the line is connected. Oh, it's open, right? So there's a gap in the middle. The air gap doesn't let you pass the electrons. Any question between distinguishing between the two, open and closed. Any questions? Okay. Now here's the part that kind of throws people. You may or may not know, but you can build an AND logic gate out of wire and simple components. If you had a light bulb and you had a battery and you had two gates or switches, right? That's, a, that's an on and off switch. Everybody sees that, right? So it's like, okay, the you could have literally a physical light switch. So you have a wire that goes into the light switch and it's turned off. And that means there's a disconnect between the lines, right? Everybody sees the disconnect? Yeah. Now, yeah. If, you, if you continue that wire or pin, to the other side and there's a second one right after that we call that series 
we have a series of gates. We have a series of switches. Well, I'm talking about electrical switches, right? So I have an electric switch that I can open up and that's off and I can close it. And now the circuit is closed. But if I have another one in the same series, if the wire continues and here's the next one, I'm still off if that one's open. So series means that the on off switches are, are one after another like Christmas tree lights. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? This would be like Christmas tree light, Christmas tree light. What happens if you break a Christmas tree light with the old Christmas tree lights? What happens to the string of lights? None of them work. None of them work. And then when they were improved, okay, they only light to a point. And then after that, all the other ones are dead, right? So series means one after another, after another, all connected end to end like this. That's series. Now here's parallel. An OR can be created, on the other hand, if I have two concentric loops of wire that overlap partially, what do I mean? Let's look at the A gate, the A switch. If I have a loop of wire that extends furthest out and I have a switch A here, an electric switch, an on off switch, like your light switch in the house, and it's open, right? then I break the loop between the battery and the light. But let's say that part of that wire was spliced. So I get to this point and I join another wire and I create a second switch. And I put that in here and we'll call that, we'll call that B, right? If I set A to one, meaning it's closed and B to one in series, only when both are closed do I get an output that's on where the light bulb is on. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, now in parallel, when I create a parallel or branch circuit, I branch off. Now I have a, another set of wire that runs in parallel to the first set of wire. And I have a second switch but it's not in series, it's in parallel. So there's a splice here or a join, right? A splice here and a join. If I close the B switch, I have a complete circuit and the light goes on. So if B is closed, the light is on, but what if B is open? I can close A and the light is on. Or what happens if they're both closed? The light is on. How is it or when is it, I find the light is off. A is open. Go ahead, say it. A and B are open. A and B are open, yeah. And this is profoundly simple, but profoundly easy to misinterpret. It's like, okay, series is and, parallel is or. It creates or logic, right? And that's amazing because because that's what we start doing with electronic components. In the 1940s and, well, 30s, actually, uh, how many of you know that someone actually invented a color TV during the Great Depression? In the late 1920s and early 30s, a gentleman by the name of Farlow Farnsworth, they had radio, but he said, hey, if, if we can do sound, why can't we do pictures? Farlow Farnsworth figured out how to, funny name, yeah, Farlow Farnsworth, created the first TV and went to patent the TV. Well, some friends of RCA, you, I don't know if you've ever heard of RCA, but RCA used to be a household name like GE and LG and Samsung. RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. RCA found out and they're like, oh no, we can't, we can't let Farlow market this thing. So they stonewalled him and they disrupted his business dealings. They sabotaged his contracts. They did everything. They stalled him for about 15 years until his patent ran out. And then in the late 40s and early 50s, they came out with their own television. Where am I going with this? They originally developed 
something called a vacuum tube. And the vacuum tube had on and off switches like this. So a vacuum tube was a way of creating a physical representation of on and off components. And uh, they were made with glass. And those vacuum tubes became transistors. We'll get into transistors a whole lot more. Uh, two flavors of transistors, NPN and PNP. Basically, they found out that vacuum tubes are, well, they're big, they're bulky, they take a lot of power. The first computers that were ever built would take up the size of two large classrooms in RT Park or CAB building, right? For the same kind of computing capacity you could get with a calculator, a handheld calculator. So, Oh, it's pretty amazing, but it took years to build and it took longer to maintain and it used lots and lots of electricity and it was really old school. Then materials science caught up and they came up with these little semiconductor wafers that do the same thing called transistors, okay? So you had transistors. Um, that's all I'm going to say about the circuits at first. I just wanted to take a moment to flesh that out. Any questions about how common physical circuits can be used to make an AND, to make an OR with physical components? Okay, moving right along. When we have compound Boolean functions, we're doing the same thing multiple times. Uh, we're stringing multiple ands together. Uh, we've already talked about that. So if we string together two ands, we'd have an A and B input, and then that output would be combined with a C input with a, a second and, and that would allow us to have three inputs. This is the Boolean function a compound function for an AND that has more than one input and uh, has more than two inputs, right? So you have three inputs and then you could have a fourth and a fifth. We'd call those compound. Composite is when you start, you start, um, well, you start mixing it up, right? So, I know I've um, used those terms before, but what we want to do is is be consistent. We want to be consistent with uh, our use. The important thing to understand is that in electronic terms, the magic started to happen when we took the output of an OR and flipped it with a NOT, or we took the output of an AND and we flipped it with a NOT. Um, you know what? I have this, I have this description reversed. My apologies. So let's, yeah, let's be consistent. A composite logic gate is when you have the same logic gate over and over again. An example of a composite Boolean function. Um, compound is when we're mixing it up. And I think that's what I did in the last module, right? I said, you're building your first compound module using two different, yeah, that's right. My apologies, I think I need some more coffee this morning. Remember, composite is multiples of the same logic gate. Compound is when you start using different ones and complex would be compound on steroids. Complex would be compound on steroids. Everybody with me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep, glad it's Friday. So the basic transistors mimic the functions of NAND and NOR, and then also AND, OR, and NOT. So basic transistors or physical uh, building blocks are composed of microscopic semiconductors like silicon. And when you, when you etch the silicon, etching means that you're gonna create a scratch and then fill the scratch with metal. Etching means that you're creating a trace, almost like a trough, and then you're filling that with metal. That creates these 
metallic looking lines. Everybody's seen circuit boards with these gold and copper lines on them, right? Everybody's seen that before? Yes. Okay. So you can keep reducing the size of that and do it all in silicon. So you can create this semiconductor chip and then scratch that chip and etch the it's a little bit more comp it's a lot more complicated i'm way oversimplifying but the result is dramatic and what you get are are large scale transistor functions that can be etched into a very small semiconductor to create what's called an integrated circuit integrated circuit now why the circuit we go back to this right circuit hello hello Right, an integrated circuit is a compound circuit etched into silicon. So the, the term integrated circuit, it's not integrated chip. IC was the original acronym used to describe a computer chip. An integrated circuit takes less, much less electricity to operate these less than five volts, there's a tipping point. In electronics, in the electronics and computer industry, the world progressed only as far as uh, to a certain point when the materials required five volts of electricity. When computer engineers and material scientists devised a semiconductor um, fabrication method that allowed much less than five volts, then things really took off because five volts is the physical science tipping point for, for size reduction. When you shrink down the, a, let's look this up now. I gotta look this up. This is something we gotta look up. It's just quick. So how many transistors in an AMD Threadripper? And we'll say third generation. Okay, so everybody see this? So an AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX chip uses etchings on the semiconductor down to a scale of 12 nanometers. Nano means billionth of a meter. So millimeter, everybody remembers a meter stick, right? I remember a meter stick, it wasn't pleasant. I used to get beat with a meter stick when I was in elementary school because I was mischievous in class. I was very playful in class. Full disclosure, right? So I was a playful kid in class and I knew what a meter stick was because, well, I was personally acquainted with what a meter stick is good for. And it's good for a classroom discipline. But if you take a meter stick, which is a little longer than a yard or three feet, there are 1,000 little graduations. If you look at the length, there's these teeny tiny little lines and it's called millimeters, right? So a thousandth of a meter is a millimeter. If we split each one of those little teeny tiny ones by a thousand more, that's a micrometer or micrometer. And then when you take each of those and split it a thousand times again, you get a nanometer or billionth of a meter. So what are we saying? The etchings on the semiconductor are measured in nanometers, billionths of a meter. And what do you call a thousand? million. What's the other word for a thousand million? Anyone? A billion. A billion yes. 19.2 billion transistors. This is 19.2 billion or 19,200 million transistors. And that's in one thread ripper. Woof. It's a lot of transistors, right? 
Now, this link should still be good. This is a great website. Larger multi-purpose components are called very large scale integration chips, VLSI chips. You need to be familiar with the acronyms for this, uh, for this module, right? So the combination of logic gates is simple, but there's usually a dominant host or logic gate, a logic gate that serves as the primary container for the other logic gates inside, okay? So here we see an over-exaggerated and, and so, but that's the, that's the interface view and inside is and and and. So what are we saying? When you're creating logic gates, compound and complex logic gates, you wanna decide which one is the most dominant. Oftentimes when there are different logic gates, the last logic gate to receive output before it comes out of the whole thing, the, the last one furthest on the right often has a very dominant role, plays a dominant role. So let me repeat that again. If we had an and and a not, the not would have, play a dominant role, which is why we put the and in front of the or, the and, that's why we call it nand and nor. The nor is, the nor has a dominant role, right? By adding more and more, you can create multi-bit logic gates and arrays. So now when you do this kind of thing, this diagram is literally this Boolean function. It's the same thing. So here's the yellow and with A and B. And then here's the C combined with the AND. So the A and B inputs are processed together first with an AND. And then the output from the other is, is what we, uh, where we go. So in this case, we've already touched on this, but now we're gonna have a formal way of describing this. In our previous module, when I walked through the example of a compound logic gate with two different logic gates, I applied a not to just one of the inputs. If you have a not on this side applying to one input, it's referred to as a differential input Okay, uh, the, uh, uh, a logic gate is applied differentially. It means it's, it's a custom application in a given, in one place, differential. It's not, it's not applied uniformly. A uniform or universal approach would be when you take all of the, out, all of the outputs and you feed it into a single logic gate, that would be a universal or unilateral or uniform application of a logic gate. So when you hear the terms differential, I want you to think on the input side, okay, it's, it, it, it only, it's only implemented in specific cases. When you have it on the outside or output side of things, where that logic gate effect is universal or uniform or unilateral, it means that it's that logic gate is on this side. Does everybody understand what we're talking about here? So if I say differential, I'm usually talking about inputs. If I say universal, I'm usually talking about outputs. And right here, a common shorthand to represent a nor isn't to put a triangle. We mentioned this in our last module. It's to have like this open dot, right? An open dot on yeah. the end of an or, that's a nor. Any questions? No. Okay. Well, this is where we're gonna stop for today. Um, good luck with your first attempt on the module two assessment over the weekend. Um, I'm going to stop recording and stop sharing. <laughs>